all. Um, it's wonderful to see how many people are participating in this event. Thank you for joining us. And it is just an absolute thrill for me to have the chance to talk with someone who has become a, a dear friend and, and guide to me, really, to uh, just how pervasive the problem of systemic corruption is in our society uh, and in the world at this point. Um, I uh, loved reading Sarah's book the first time. My copy is just studded with exclamation points and wows and other enthusiasms. And I really appreciated even more the beautiful construction of it uh, on reading it again for this event tonight. If this is just an astoundingly rich book people. I mean, you will gain insight into so very much uh, from this. And there's no gainsaying the urgency of the story and the analysis that, that Sarah presents. Uh, so it's no wonder that the Washington Post uh, included it among its 10 must-reads for uh, August. Um, it's really a terrific book. You know, you can pick up any day's newspaper, sadly, and see systemic corruption once once your eyes are trained to see it. Certainly in Beirut, I thought of you, uh, Sarah, with that horrible explosion after all your reporting on the Middle East. I'm sure you were very much aware of, of what was behind that. Um, and you have studied corruption uh, and its consequences on four continents now. Uh, but with this book on corruption, you're bringing that understanding you developed in other places home. And so tonight, I imagine that we'll see some mix of that, some of the beauty of the book that takes us around the world to understand better what is happening in our own country. Um, there is a lot to talk about here. Uh, I'm going to be mindful of the clock to make sure that we can get to uh, listeners' questions. Uh, but let me say for now, perhaps the best way for us to start would be if you're willing to do um, a brief reading to just get people, uh, give people a sense of the kind of the texture and the flavor of your work. Um, could we do that? Do you have something? Sure. Yeah. And, and let thank you, Nancy. And let me just, you know, this is a little embarrassing, but this is, guys, this is mutual admiration club. <laughs> I mean, or society. I mean, Nancy, Democracy in Chains, I just, it's like my eye shot open and it was like, oh my God. You know, and in fact, coming to Nancy's book from my experience overseas, and in particular, as I was beginning work on this one, I mean, Nancy's book was a, was a Bible, you know, as I was working on this, it was like, oh, I don't have to do network mapping for the United States because Nancy did it, you know? So they really are companion books in a lot of ways, but I, I think I will, um, I'll start at the beginning, and this is partly Nancy's advice, uh, I must say. But um, I mean, I launched the book at a kind of pivotal moment in my own thinking, and it's not as though I wasn't already beginning to think about the United States by 2016. But, I, you know, I'm standing in my kitchen, right? And I don't know how you all like to end the day, but I love to end it with some beer and, you know, like some onions sizzling in the frying pan and or the skillet and that's and that's where I was and I I knew we were in for the last crop of Supreme Court decisions for the season for the year this is 2016 so we're in the summer of 2016 it's like June, late June you all remember I mean we just had Brexit uh Hillary Clinton is way ahead in the polls um there'd be massive flooding in Appalachia you know that's kind of the end environment and my ear is tuned for what did the Supreme Court do. So here I am, I scrape onions into the sizzling pan. I'm listening to the Diane Rehm Show, a thoughtful current events program on, on national public radio where I was once a reporter. Suddenly, I'm transfixed. The Supreme Court overturned, this was the case I was listening for, the corruption conviction of Bob McDonnell, who was the former governor of Virginia, the vote, this is what really got me, the vote I'm hearing was eight to zero. Not a single one of the Supreme Court justices could find a way to, uh, to follow the reasoning of that jury of Virginians or of his or her own colleagues on the US Court of Appeals. This had been obviously a unanimous conviction at, on a, at a jury trial at the district level unanimous um, upholding of that conviction on appeal, and the Supreme Court unanimously overturns it. Um, not one could figure out why McDonald's behavior might be criminally corrupt. 
And what McDonald had done was, I mean, it was the most basic quid pro quo bribery, right? There had been a guy who was a tobacco guy who was trying to like retool himself as pharmaceuticals, right? Like our favorite industries, right? Tobacco and, and big pharma. And he was trying to concoct these pills out of a tobacco-based substance that supposedly, you know, cured everything from skin rashes to, you know, amnesia. Um, and he needed clinical trials. I mean, again, it's quite relevant today. He needed clinical trials. So he starts giving Governor McDonald at the time, you know, gifts of money and campaign donations and rides in his airplane and a wedding dress for actually paying for the wedding of his daughter and a Rolex watch. I mean, it was just, it was textbook stuff. And the prosecutors had even been able to link the timing like, you know, McDonald would, sorry, uh, the businessman would give McDonald a loan and five minutes later, McDonald would pick up the phone and like lean on his Department of Health and Human Resources to, you know, do the clinical trials, okay? The justices saw it this way. The case fell under the statute that makes bribing public officials illegal in the United States. It says a public official may not even indirectly, quote, demand, seek, receive, accept, or agree to receive or accept anything of value personally or for any other person or entity in return for being influenced in the performance of any official act. The court honed in, honed in on those two words. Um, and they are defined by law. It means any decision or action on any question, matter, cause, suit, proceeding, or controversy, which may at any time be pending, or which may by law be brought, may by law be brought before any public official in such official's official capacity, et cetera. So, you know, you're talking a really broad definition here. And basically what the judge, justices decided was, well, if you criminalize what McDonald did, then, you know, as they wrote, the basic cons compact underlying representative government assumes that public officials will hear from their constituents and act appropriately on their concerns. Whether it's the union official worried about a plant closing or the homeowners who wonder why it took five days to restore power to their neighborhood after a storm. If the McDonald decision stood, the justices fretted, quote, officials might wonder whether they could respond to even the most commonplace requests for assistance and citizens with legitimate concerns might shrink from participating in democratic discourse. Never mind the false equivalency. Never mind that most citizens with legitimate concerns do not dispose of tens of thousands of dollars or Ferraris they can you know, loan to help focus officials' attention on these concerns. So that's really where the book launches. Um, from that glaring discrepancy between how ordinary Americans understand corruption and how an increasingly unanimous view by the elites in this country across the political spectrum are narrowing and narrowing and narrowing and narrowing the technical definition of what is legally corrupt or not corrupt. And from that divergence, in my view, you get really explosive behaviors. That's what I have looked at overseas, is that when ordinary people get no recourse against behavior that manifestly, you know, corresponds to what they understand to be corrupt, when they get no recourse, if you will, within the civil organization of their society and government, they go to extremes. And what I discovered in Afghanistan was they turned to the Taliban because of that. And across the Arab world, they turned to demonstrations. And as you pointed out, you know, in Lebanon, you know, it was mass protest and they just have toppled their government. And so for me, some of the unexpected voting 
in 2016, frankly, on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. I think was related to this frustration to do with corruption. That's powerful. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the things that your your work really points us toward is the those court decisions that we don't focus on, right? The ones where there's been so much unanimity about what corporations should be able to do um, and and why that is legitimate in a way that is just gobsmacking to the ordinary citizen uh, who understandably feels like the system is rigged. Um, we're going to uh, move around in this story. You know, your 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 book is is just e extraordinary. I think in the way that you delve into mythology and into primatology. You know, the study of primates and uh, evolution to to understand how we came to this point, as well as deep history and, and current reporting. Uh, so I'll circle back to those. But let us talk for a moment about what's on so many people's minds right now, which is the Trump administration, because nine tenths of our news seem to be about the Trump administration now when we're not talking about COVID. But, um, you know, of course, he, uh, the Trump organization and the Trump presidency um, have uh, gotten a lot of attention for corrupt practices. There's been a, you know, huge amount of, of really important investigative reporting. What does your approach uh, do that's different from that? You know, what? how do you equip readers to, to kind of see the world with a different set of eyes in a way that, that they might find useful, um, uh, you know, that, that aren't part of what they're, they're getting from, from other sources? I think so often what we get when we read about corruption is one specific story. Mm -hmm. And so often in great detail, because you know, investigative reporters have to prove that this is true. So, and I've done it and you've done it, I'm sure. I mean, you go start going down a rabbit hole, you know, and then this, oh my God, and then this connects to that and this connects to that. And it becomes, you know, a very well reported individual story of venality. And even as we think about the Trump administration, where there has been story after story after story after story, and we say to ourselves somehow, hmm, boy, that feels, you know, there's a lot of them. It feels like, oh, there's a whole stack of these stories. So it's a practice of this group. What I think we're missing is that this isn't even just, just, um, you know, a whole bunch of venal or tawdry individual events by individual venal officials or business people. In fact, it's closer to something like the operating system, if you will, of what I have found to be both abroad and in the United States, what you could call an integrated network. Yeah. By integrated network, I mean that it's a web of individuals who are connected, often through personal relationships, having been to school together, having worked together, having done business deals together over the years, who straddle the, a lot of the sectors that we Americans tend to hold separate in our minds. And by that, I mean, for example, the public and private sector. Right? So we Americans could get into long discussions about who's worse for your health, right? The public sector or the private sector. Um, in fact, these networks very skillfully weave the two together. And you have individuals, so we talk about the revolving door. But that again implies that one individual yeah. is pushing a door between two separate sectors, the private sector and the public sector. Rather, and you, you know, certainly showed us this within the very networked, or I want to say very integrated Koch network. This, it's the, it's the network that's kind of the organism, and it will deploy its personnel into different positions, into the, you know, business sector, into the nonprofit sector, into the public sector, uh, sometimes into the out-and-out -out criminal sector. I mean, I first started looking at this in, in Afghanistan where you had the president's brother was a gigantic drug dealer. The same is true in, uh, in Honduras, you know, where relatives of presidents have been, you know, running a significant portion of the narcotics industry. Um, 
in, in a variety of ways. And they can run it as traffickers. They can also run it as the people who appoint individuals who man the borders along the trafficking routes, right? And so that brings us to the role of those individuals who, members of the network, who hold public office. Some of them simply loot the coffers, right? And we saw this, um, you know, in some Trump administration officials who, you know, were getting fancy security guards that were basically helping themselves in one way or another. That's kind of the tip of the iceberg. The much more important thing that they do, the members of the network who hold public office, is to bend the instruments of power that they control to serve the network rather than the people. Mm -hmm. And they do this by weaponizing their agencies, like the Department of Justice, for example. They do it by hollowing them out. Um, so where the agencies have some independence, what you'll find is um, uh, vacancies, significant vacancies of personnel. You'll find people being underpaid. You'll find them being underutilized. You'll find them being dispatched to, I mean, I saw anti-corruption prosecutors in Afghanistan, you know, when they took on a case against a palace official, you know, were immediately demoted. Uh, their salaries were cut and they were sent, you know, to Taliban infested districts in the eastern part of the country. Well, you know, it may not be quite that bad in this country, but you've seen people getting fired right and left. Um, and you have seen, I mean, some of the more, I want to say, less well-known examples that I know of. If, if anyone remembers um, the EPA administrator Pruitt had this very large bodyguard. Um, and he used to go roaring through the streets of Washington, D.C. in the wrong direction, for example. And so the Washington, D.C. Police Department was not at all happy and was kind of saying, look it, you got, you know, you can't keep doing that. But anyway, he had this round-the-clock security detail, which no prior administrator had ever had. Uh, it turns out that it was manned by highly trained criminal investigators because the EPA is also a law enforcement agency, right? It's in charge of investigating oh, environmental crime. Yeah, I remember and that. So they had reassigned highly skilled, you know, criminal investigators to babysit the boss, basically. Well, that meant that they couldn't be out chasing bad guys. That's so a great example. The, the, you know, these are the kinds of things that the network does, but by having such a broad range of members, it means that they dispose of these kleptocratic networks, dispose of a huge array of capabilities and talents. Yeah. So uh, I, that was a great example of, of like the repurposing of personnel and understanding how, how the networks are served. I'm guessing that most uh, people who are on this, this call or this Zoom event, whatever we call it, um, most people, uh, would agree that this, this is the most corrupt administration we've ever seen right now that we're dealing with. Um, but one of the things that your book really challenges us to think about is the deeper structures of all of this, that when a society becomes as deeply systemically corrupted as ours is now, it starts to bring in all players. And, and I think, it, you know, I hope nobody's going to jump on me for raising this as we're going into this, you know, critical election. But, but I think it's important for, for people to understand the kind of patterns that you're pointing to. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about with the Obama administration, here we had one of the most, you know, intelligent, um, uh, one of the cleaner, you know, he tried to certainly make it one of the cleaner administrations, one of the most, you know, scandal-free modern administrations. And yet you also saw some of this, this kind of network uh, self-dealing happening um, there. Uh, you don't write as much about it, but you want to just share some of that so people can get a sense of, of the, the breadth of what you're talking about with these, these, these networks? Yeah, and, and I would like, I, I, I'd just like to pause on the way you frame that, Nancy. Mm -hmm. One is, I remember asking, I think actually it was a Nigerian. I did a lot of work on Nigerian corruption, and I asked a friend of mine about, you know, the setup there. 
mm-hmm. and he said it's corrupt and corrupting mm-hmm. and i think it's really important to bear in mind i also have a a little deep dive into the savings and loan crisis yes that and was that was absolutely a case where it was corrupt and corrupting you mm-hmm. had systemic fraud in savings and loan institutions but it also corrupted the whole ecosystem, uh, real estate ecosystem, meaning appraisers who wouldn't overvalue, you know, ha- um, building projects couldn't find work anymore. And, you know, I mean, there was a whole ecosystem that could no longer find work. And the banks that, you know, were committing this fraud were registering a high rate of growth. And so they were seen as the most successful banks. So honest bankers were losing customers. I mean, and so I think it's very important for all of us, no matter what our political persuasion, to take a hard look in the mirror because it is too easy, even with the Trump administration being what I consider to be a bit of an apotheosis of this phenomenon, it's just too easy for Democrats you know, or or democratic leaning American citizens to sort of point the finger and only notice corruption on the other side of the aisle and vice versa. And so I urge every single one of us to look well in the mirror. And so I would just talk about, I mean, you asked Obama and I'll get there in a second, but Senator Menendez is another one. So Senator Menendez had a case against him because he was helping a doctor Uh, who was defrauding Medicaid, and Menendez was trying to get him let off from this fraud of Medicaid. And what was he doing to defraud Medicaid, this doctor? He was um, basically prescribing unnecessary eye operations on elderly people. So he was having people get their eyes cut open when the older people, our elders, get their eyes cut open when they didn't need it. And Menendez was was trying to get a dispensation from HHS for these fraudulent Medicaid charges. The guy, the doctor went to jail, but Menendez didn't because of the McDonald ruling. And now you have like the whole Democratic Party establishment, you know, lining up behind Menendez. We can't do this. We, I'm not a member of the Democratic Party. I'm saying we Americans cannot do this. The Obama administration, for me, the most important issue was Eric Holder. Mm Eric Holder came to the Attorney General's office from Covington and Burling. Covington and Burling is a large law firm in Washington, and many of Mr. Holder's clients at Covington and Burling were large banks. The same goes for Mr. Lanny Brewer, who was Eric Holder's chief of criminal division. How many banks were prosecuted? How many bankers? were prosecuted in the wake of 2008. Basically, none. That's not an accident. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. What that is, is bending the Department of Justice to serve the purposes of the network as opposed to the purposes of the people. And that is part of what gave us Donald Trump, because people were so infuriated that no one was held to account for 2008 that many of them voted for Trump as a kind of protest vote. Now, anyone can point out that that was a perverse reaction. Well, that's what I could have told my neighbors in Kandahar, Afghanistan, who joined the Taliban in disgust and indignation at the corruption of the Karzai regime and the American role in reinforcing and enabling it. When people go to extremes, they're not making rational, you know, comparative politics decisions, right? Yeah. They want to blow something up. They're voting for a wrecking ball, be it an extremist movement or an extremist political figure. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm starting to see some questions develop in the, the Q&A stream, right. so I'm mindful of those and, and we'll begin to bring those in. I want to ask you though something else uh, before we start to take in the questions uh, and that is because uh, I, I think it's important that um, folks who are, are watching and listening get a sense of the range of this book, which just astounded me. Um, and from what we've said so far, you might think it's a journalist reporting just, you know, on the contemporary 
America and the contemporary world, which is important in its own right, and your view is, is much larger than most of ours. But what's kind of amazing to me about this book is the, the deep history that you use to illuminate the present, um, including deep history and mythology. You go in the early chapters, you have a or for first part, you have a setup that includes uh, the Midas, <laughs> the myth of, of Midas, King Midas, um, and then a section on Jesus, uh, and then a section on Aristotle. And we won't have time to go into all of those um, and get to some of the other pressing issues that people will want to talk about. But I was just totally blown away by what you did with that tiny little passage in the Bible about Jesus um, throwing the money changers out of the, the temple and, and tossing over their tables. Do you want to talk a little bit about why you thought it was important to go back to some of these early stories in order to help people see what we're facing here? Thank you so much for that, because it really was important to me. And I, let me put it this way. I think that, you know, in this modern age, and especially right now, you know, we as a society have kind of rejected what you could call myth or sacred story mm -hmm. as a source of insight into ourselves, our species, how we function in the world. And increasingly, I find that it's like we're being forced to live our mythology because we're not looking to mythology for, and I mean mythology not in the sense that something's a myth as opposed to being true. I mean the much deeper sense of mythology as a real symbolic communication that gets at a very profound truth about the human condition. And we have rejected those. And... Um, so Midas, it turns out, you know, of the Golden Touch is typically just a kind of sy sy synonym for greed. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a Midas, at least one Midas, and he was king in Phrygia right about the time, I'm kind of giving away a punchline here, but right around the time that money was invented. Now, money is a brand new phenomenon. And the great Greek thinkers, they were only writing, you know, Socrates and, 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 you know, or Aristotle, I want to say, and Sophocles and Aristophanes, those guys come in there. They're only writing in the first hundred or so years after the invention of money, and they were blown away by it, and really wrestling with it. And so what I get at there is how money is different from other measures of value. And we, currently today in America, have made money the main yardstick for measuring social achievement. That means that acquiring money is a race with no finish line. Because however much somebody has, somebody has, the competitor needs to have more. And that means you convert, just like Midas touched an apple and it became gold, or touched his daughter and she became gold, well, he could sell him at market, sell her at market, but his, his intangible relationship with that unique individual no longer existed. And that's what we are doing today. We are converting everything of intrinsic worth in our society into cold, hard cash, basically. And it ain't even cold and hard anymore. It's zeros in bank accounts. Yeah. That's the Midas disease. All right, that's the Midas disease, and it's unbelievably dangerous to human societies and to our planet. I mean, it's like fatal. Then the next phase is once the Midas disease has set in, then you have dominator networks that start weaving themselves into these kleptocratic networks to figure out how to rig the system so that they get more money than anybody else. That's Jesus. That is what Jesus was up against. So there are these two lines of gospel, and I did the same thing as I had done with Midas. I started reading into the archaeology and, and things like that. And it's like, whoa, I had no idea the temple of Jerusalem was gold-plated. I mean, it looked like a Trump Tower. I mean, are you kidding me? You know, the place where it was the most magnificent building east of Rome. There was a bank. That's where the bank was. That's where the high court was. That's where, you know, the money changers were. It's where they, it even had a garrison. I mean, I think I wrote that it was some unholy combination of, gosh, you know, of, of Fort Knox 
Wall Street, Washington, D.C., and the U.S. military base in, in you know, Qatar, all uh, in that temple precinct. That is what Jesus took on when he strode up those steps. Mm. And what's so stunning about what he did, he didn't really say much. Mm -hmm. What he did was he gathered a coalition of ordinary people and told the regular folks, drop your identity divides. Love thy neighbor, right? Love thy neighbor, including the tax collectors, but those are like the little guys, right? You know? So it's love thy neighbor across all of the different tribalisms and things like that. He divided food equally among the group the loaves and the fishes, and that's one way that humans have consolidated an egalitarian coalition. And then he basically said shame. You called him a performance, you called it performance art, I love that. Right, I mean, it was pointing out to his coalition, this is who we need to basically ostracize. He didn't kill anyone, mm -hmm. but he said these people are worthy of shame. Now, that was, if you think about it, that was the most violent act that this Prince of Peace committed. And when I discussed it with some pa pastors, they were a little uncomfortable with it. Like they, they were, this was like not their favorite part of the Bible because they didn't know how to handle this act of violence. The other thing that's very interesting in that little tiny passage is the passage says that was when the power structure decided they had to kill him. It wasn't the loaves and the fishes or love thy neighbor. It was overturning the money, the money to change your stables. Then they had to kill him. So I find it a very profound passage. And these sacred stories weave their way throughout the book. And I do think we have a lot to learn from the wisdom of the Greeks and the Nigerians. I mean, there's a Nigerian myth in there too. And you know, the myth of the Hydra has a lot to it that can tell us things that 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 can help us think about where we are. Thank you for that. The questions are building up in okay, the let's see So I'm gonna I also want people to know there's a huge slice of American history in the middle of this book about the Gilded Age and how these kinds of practices created what we know as the Gilded Age um, and how they enforced their rules through the courts, etc., and what it took to to overcome uh, that system for a time. But because there's so many questions also about what to do in the contemporary moment, I think you'll be able, Sarah, in your responses to those, perhaps yeah. to gesture back to some of the history. I do want to tell folks in the, the chat, people who are putting questions in the chat, that you need to put your questions into the Q&A because that's what I was told to monitor and I can't, I can't um, uh, do both. But I'm going to start, there was a question from Edris Aribs, uh, who's from Afghanistan and who was saying he, he is aligned with what, uh, what you've um, said as to uh, President Karzai and, and the, the trouble in, in Afghanistan. I'm going to suggest that Edris read your earlier book, Thieves of State, because it is so centrally about what's going on in Afghanistan, yeah. and an equally beautiful book that also reaches deep into uh, early Islamic history, and, and your training was actually in, in Islamic history, Sarah. So, uh, so I'll punt that one. There's a lot of questions about what to do, and I want to make sure to save time for them. Uh, but let me uh, say there's one actually from, from a friend and colleague of mine, Claudia Kuntz, who, who raises an interesting question. She says, are you describing the model of a mafia state? Mm -hmm. Tony Soprano, the godfather, Casa Nostra, this would appear to transcend any p particular political form. And Claudia is also a spe uh, specialist on uh, Nazi Germany. Um, so I think she's, she probably has you know, some of that history in mind. But are, you, are, are we talking about a mafia-like system? I think or is that's it a very interesting um... I think it's a very interesting comparison. In particular, the vertical integration of mafia systems where, which really affects the justice function. Yeah. Um, what's very important about the way, again, I'm not a specialist on, on mafia type organizations, but from what I understand, part of the d deal is once you're in, no matter how lowly you are, you, get protection from the system so long as you fulfill whatever your role is to the system and in particular you help send a flow of revenue up 
up the ranks of the system, what the deal, the vertical deal is protection in return for spoils moving, protection going down the ranks in return for spoils moving up the ranks. And that can help us really decode some of the ways that President Trump is meddling with the justice function in this country. Mm -hmm. It's not just about doing favors for his friends. Yeah. It's that, that bargain really holds these type of systems together. I think another point about uh, mafias that is very relevant is often people, th there is no way to be honest and not a victim when mafia sy systems have taken real hold. It's the gold or the lead choice. You have a binary choice. Either you're a victim, and not everyone is killed, obviously, but they become you know, beaten down and victimized and they can never get ahead, or they become part of it. And that's why once these systems have taken hold, most ambitious, self-respecting people, not most, but a great many, end up colluding with the system. Because otherwise they just can't you know, reach a stature in their lives that they think they're worthy of. And so they end up compromising and often in a country like ours, they won't actually become members of the mafia, but they'll become members of the very large, I want to say, enabling classes. And the enabling classes, you know, include real estate agents, think tanks. I mean, goodness, uh, I'm going to do it, okay? I used to work at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Number one, they didn't want this book. Mm. They didn't want to be the host of this book. Number two, shortly after I left, they put on their board a woman named uh, Ngozi Ikweala, who is the former finance minister of Nigeria. When she was finance minister of Nigeria, $1 billion a month was walking out of the oil revenues. Not exactly $1 billion, $900 million, excuse me, approximately $1 billion a month. Now, I am not accusing her of stealing any of that money because I don't have any evidence. What I do have evidence of is that she, this was happening on her watch. She never, either in public or private, um, raised the issue. Anyway, I don't need to go down this rabbit yeah. hole. What I'm trying to say is that the Carnegie Endowment put her on its board. Mm -hmm. That is called enabling. <laughs> You know? Yes. Well, I work for a university that has welcomed investment from Charles Koch, as have 300 other ones. So that's a rabbit hole, we, but we don't need to go down because there's so many good questions from, well, from viewers. But um, someone, um, uh, Jennifer Carius, asked about the Powell memo and trying to think about um, the courts, the think tanks, et cetera. And one of your chapters is actually called The Scales. Um, and it's looking at, and it, it points out how these uh, net corrupt and corrupt corrupting networks through all of these societies, one of the first things that they try to do, you say, is get hold of the justice function, right? The courts and the right. Did you want to explain that? Say a little yeah, bit about and that? And again, I really defer to you on this because you, I really learned a lot about, I had heard of it before, but but I really learned the impact of the, of the Powell memo from you. Okay. So Justice Powell, uh, had been a lawyer def uh, representing the tobacco industry. And we all know what that means. I mean, that means a protracted campaign to hide the reality of the dangerousness of tobacco from the American public and to prevent warning labels being affixed to cigarettes, to, you know, all of that stuff. He was in charge of that whole effort by the tobacco industry as their general counsel and he was on the board of Philip Morris. Then he writes this memo in 1971, is that correct? Uh, 72, I believe. Right. Or, no, 71. Right in there in the very early 70s mm -hmm. to the US Chamber of Commerce, basically with his hair on fire saying that, you know, um, the enterprise system is under attack in the United States, meaning there were some regulations being placed on corporations, you know, um, and therefore we have to strike back. And it's a very detailed blueprint for how to do that, including explicitly take over the justice sector. Um, and that means, you know, creating, ed you know, educational programs, 
retraining rising judges in, you know, what is basically now called market-based morality. I mean, in a whole set of legal arguments that would support the, um, you know, objectives, frankly, of the kleptocratic network. And so a bunch of schools of which uh, George Mason University was one of the leaders, but not the only one, um, they started basically getting bridge holds, right? Uh, um, is that the word that I'm looking for? Um, foot, footholds in, or beachheads, beachheads in various different law schools, including Harvard Law School, including, you know, a number of very prestigious ones. And from those vantage points, doing this training, beginning to place judges throughout the system, and most spectacularly supported the Federalist Society, which was launched by a bunch of Yale uh, law students, but immediately was taken under the wing of this whole, um, I want to say, campaign. And now it vets our federal judges. And I still haven't been able to find a total number over time of federal judges that have been you know, officially approved or are otherwise networked into the Federalist Society, but I think it's quite frightening. Okay, um, so shifting to lots of people want to talk about the approach of November and then what comes after as well. But so here, oh, oh, what maybe so maybe we'll we'll take um, probably about I think I can pull in about four more um, if if we we do them tightly. But one uh, person raised the question: Are you concerned that all this discussion and exposure of corruption will feed people's conspiracy theories around the deep state, et cetera? What, what, what do you say to that when people say things like that to you? I mean, I think it's a very legitimate question. Um, and I think we have to be a little bit careful how we talk about this. This quote unquote deep state, as I understand how that term is being used, um, particularly by people on the right in this country, refers to civil servants. Mm -hmm. It refers to people in the bureaucracy in Washington um, of various agencies, largely the executive branch, but not exclusively. These are people making between thirty and a hundred thousand dollars a year. These are not our enemies, even if they were as evil as you know they're made out to be. These are not our enemies. Who, by our, I don't mean Democrats. I mean. The American citizens uh, or the American people's enemies. The enemies of the American people are the political appointees who are drawn from the top ranks of industry. It is the Secretary of Treasury. It is the Secretary of Commerce. It is the uh, cha um, you know Scott Senate Majority Leader and his wife, the Secretary of Transportation. These are the people who are bending their instruments of power. And what I would say is that I think a lot of people were hoping that the kind of bureaucratic ranks would be able to put the brakes on some of that. And I think we have seen some real heroics on the part of some, in particular, younger individuals um, on the National Security Council and, and things like that in the impeachment proceedings and, and elsewhere, people who really did blow the whistle on this. But I have to say, I'm quite disappointed mm -hmm. the degree to which, you know, the bureaucrats have basically done what they are supposed to do as, um, I want to say, um, career civil servants. They have obeyed their political leadership. And so I've got friends inside EPA, I've got friends inside Commerce who say, you know, people are pretty much trying to do what the secretaries or administrator even of this administration is asking them to do. And so they, there is just nothing to the deep state argument. And I would then say that to pretend that a Menendez or a Holder is not in some way into the corrupt, I want to say, kind of um, spectrum, if you deny that, 
then that's also playing into the hands of people who say they're all corrupt. Because it is manifestly not true. It is manifestly true that a Menendez did something that any normal person would consider to be corrupt. Um, and therefore, to deny that just because he has a D after his name um, is, I think, really counterproductive. I think the only way out of the hole we're in is to be pretty brutally honest across the board. Um, and then, you know, and try to make alliances with people that we can ally with who might vote differently from the way we do on, you know, some very minimal, I want to say, commitments on the part of future candidates for office, sort of like the no new taxes commitment. I mean, let's have yeah. a no, you know, I mean, a no corporate money commitment, or we could yeah. discuss, you know, what those commitments might look like. Right. And that's where some of the questions now are going. So Aaron Goldzimmer, who's thought a lot about this, uh, these questions I know, um, says, so once a country starts walking down this road towards networked systemic corruption, as we have, what can be done? How, can, how does one restore norms and expectations around how corruption is corruption and won't be tolerated? So that's a kind of umbrella question. And then there are some more particular variants. Um, but do you want to uh, take the broad version first? So my first answer is a heart-stopping one, which goes back to history. So in order to try to answer that question for myself, I wanted to look at the last time America was on, in the grip. And it wasn't just America. Like today, it was a transnational phenomenon, and the networks were transnational. And that was, as you uh, referenced earlier, the Gilded Age. And during the Gilded Age, there were some really unbelievably wonderful resistance movements to this whole, I want to say, the Gilded Age syndrome. If we have a Midas disease, we have a Gilded Age syndrome, which is this syndrome of networked corruption. And there were incredible labor, um, labor resistance. And again, you wrote the book on that um, as a labor historian, in part, um, among other things. Um, so you could be telling everyone much more than I can, but I was really impressed by the persistence and dynamism and, and thoughtfulness of the labor movement and, and how beyond just the strictly material it was, I mean, as you know, again, as you know better than I do, the eight hour day, it wasn't just about having more rest. It was, we want the time to live as human beings. Mm -hmm. We want some space to fulfill our potential, our creative potential, our, our nurturing potential, our, we want to learn, we want to make theater, we want to, you know, and, and, and that to be a human being, we have to have some limits on the duration and the um, painfulness of labor. So that was one movement. There were some very interesting political experiments in what a different structuring and organization of society could look like. They got a really bad rap, the anarchists, for example, but there were some very interesting ideas being batted around. And I discovered the Farmers Alliance, which I had never really heard of. And that was this unbelievable rural movement across what was then the West, you know, people in covered wagons, you know, meeting at schoolhouses, and they were incredibly sophisticated. I mean, they talked about a flexible money system. We were on the gold standard at the time. They talked about direct election of senators. They talked about universal suffrage. They talked about, you know, I mean, so many of the reforms that were enacted in the New Deal and, the, and in the post-war period, they had already thought up, um, and yet none of it worked. None of it worked for 70 years this was going on and what i discovered was that it took not a disaster it took lots of them one after the other it took world war one it took the depression it took world war ii that's two wars two genocides mass starvation in europe an economic meltdown a pandemic that makes the current pandemic look like peanuts that's what it took to, I want to say, spread a kind of disaster solidarity feeling. You know how in a disaster everyone runs to help everyone? Mm -hmm. So by the end of all of these disasters, enough of the elites had been touched that it created a tipping point that changed mores. 
So what I am, why I feel so urgent about this is, oh my God, what disasters are staring us in the face right now? Yes. Because believe me, our current series from savings and loan through the dot-com crisis, through 2008, through the climate crisis, through the Trump administration, through coronavirus, and the upcoming financial meltdown, I mean, it looks exactly like the Gilded Age succession of panics. It's the same story, like I've seen this movie before. And how can we ward off this century's disaster? Like, what would our version of two world wars and a pandemic and two genocides look like? And so, so that's, that's a warning. It's not an answer. The answer has to do with it's going to take everything all at once. There is an answer. It's going to take, you know, getting really serious about these issues in terms of uh, childhood education mm -hmm. and what type of ethics are being taught in our schools to young children. We have to pay attention to that because the Cokes are sure trying to, you know, take privatize education and take over public school curriculums in high school. Take over civics education in, in civics Arizona. Education. They have, I mean, come on. We can't let that go. It means, you know, popular culture. Let's have a cop show that's the public integrity beat instead of always it being about vice and murder. Yeah. You know, it's about um, obviously legislation. It's about enforcement. So one of the things I would like to see this administration do is immediately, first of all, I want an attorney general who has worked, now we have a vice presidential candidate who's been a prosecutor, but I want an attorney general who was prosecuting corporate crime and corruption. Mm -hmm. I don't want another defense attorney yeah. in AG's position. I want money and personnel. I know we have to move some resources away from certain types of policing. Mm -hmm. I want to move some of those resources toward other types of policing, yeah. the public integrity police. Let's get, you know, the FBI investigator to work these things. Let's make it a sexy thing to do if you're a prosecutor or a, or a, and same goes for the IRS and the SEC and the FEC and the EPA, all of those regulators, you know, so that's some of it. I think we do need some further legislation, but also what can we all do ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So let's demand better of our public officials, but let's also, you know, let's buy our books at Politics and Prose. And yes, thank bookstore. you. For, I was about to say, I mean, this is such an important time for independent bookstores. Amazon, Jeff Bezos getting richer all the time, you know, through this corona crisis and, and great community institutions like this need your support, as do authors at this difficult time. It is a terrible time for good bookstores and authors alike. It's only a good time for the monopolies. That's right. And we yeah. can do the same with our banks. I mean, where, do, where are you banking your money right now? Are you banking your money with a recidivist? you know, bad actors. Self-help in Durham, North Carolina. It's a great local yeah. institution, but I think those are the kinds of questions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there's yeah. an outfit called Bank, the Coalition for Banking on, F, uh, Banking on Values. I think something like that, Google it, and you will find a bank in your, in your area. Take your money out of Citicorp. Mm -hmm. You can take your money out of Wells Fargo and put it in a local institution that's lending to your neighbors, you know, and on down the line. I think there's a lot we can do to live our values. And I'm not saying martyr ourselves, guys. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying make an effort. Yeah. And you have, you know, woven throughout the, the book in, in quite beautiful ways, I think. You, you uh, emphasize the importance of culture and of values and um, of what messages a society is conveying to future generations. And you have an epilogue, people should know, that addresses the what can you do yeah. uh, question. So I really urge you to, to get the book, to read it, and to think about all the things, as Sarah's saying, you can do in everyday life. But there are definitely some people, too, who are saying, okay, so if we get your analysis and we think systemic corruption is really important, are there things that we should be doing, you know, in the next, um, in the run-up to November? 
to set yeah. an agenda yeah. Yeah. Or, and yeah. not just for the president. You know, there's a tendency in America to only think about the, the White House, but we have state house elections that are absolutely crucial. And it was our loss of the state houses that enabled the Koch uh, power that enabled Trump to come into office. So if we're thinking about the range of things that ordinary citizens can follow up on and can demand of newly elected um, officials, what are just a few things that, that you would point to? Because unfortunately, our time is, is, uh, know, is running know. out and people have so much desire to move a good corrupt, you know, anti-corruption or corrupting agenda. Um, and, uh, and let me just say, any of you who were on this uh, cat webcast, um, I'm at Sarah Chase, first name, last name, no space, dot org. And you can, there's a contact thing, just hit contact and ask me any question you want. I'm answering everything. So we right. can continue this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I really feel like it's the minimal ethics pledge. And it is, uh, in particular, corporate money in campaigning, I think is really important. I also think look at your state's conflict of interest and revolving door statutes and gift statutes at your own state level, right? Um, any state level legislation that makes it easier to pour money, more money into state level campaigns, um, like throw a, throw a fit about that. I think those are some of the clear things and also the kind of enforcement actions that I've been talking about on a federal level, there are state anti-corruption laws too. And so those need to be enforced by all of our state attorneys general and whatnot. And also our state attorneys general are doing a lot of work on the federal level too. And so we'll be supporting them in that job. And it does mean not just complaining when an elected or appointed official does something wrong, but the ones who are doing a great job, write thank into them, say, thank you, you're fighting the good fight. You know, people love positive reinforcement too, and that's worth doing. Yeah, I would just say on that front, um, I draw people's attention to the work that uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island has been doing oh on this issue. He has a great book called um, Captured about the corporate infiltration of American democracy is the, the subtitle. And he also uh, has been a leader in the Senate fight against the Federalist Society and their growing control over our courts. And um, so that's that's a place to look because there were some a number of people talking about specific laws that, that could be moved. Um, I'm, I hate to close this out because the questions are so rich and, and the book is so amazing. But I want to end with a different kind of question uh, because you've indicated that we should expect a marathon right? This is not a sprint. Um, it could take a very long time. It took us a very long time to get to the messed up place we are in this country, and we're going to need to commit to taking a long time to get this right because we have to work on so many different dimensions. So someone asked, where did she go? Uh, a question about your own resources. Um, Sarah, where did that go? No, oh, Sally McQuaid uh, said to you, Sarah, uh, I've always found your writing e uh, equal parts blood Blunt and beautiful, both examining the smallest detail and epic in scope. I, I would second that. Um, but she asks, what are some of your influences in writing? Because I think we're all going to be doing some hard thinking, even if we're not doing writing. And it might be interesting for people to hear about some of your uh, influences, the things that keep you going and keep you thinking, because these are not easy things to, to live with every day. So so how do you, how do, you do that? What are, what are wow, some? Wow, I hadn't actually thought about that which I should have. Um, I have to say I have been reading a lot into anthropology, um, uh, indigenous peoples. I mean, some of my favorites are Wade Davis, who also I think has a new book out right now. I'm so overjoyed, I can't believe it. Um, and um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a Native American botanist, and she's written a book called um, Two that I love. One is called Gathering Moss, and the other is called uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. And what's in incredible about her is how she weaves together the Native way of understanding from the, you know, from the environment mm -hmm. and the sort of Western scientific way of understanding about the environment, if you will. I, I'm drawing a lot of wisdom from that kind of work. Uh, Joseph Campbell on mythology is just irreplaceable. So those are a little bit tangential from our immediate 
you know, um, immediate topic, but I'll think about some that are more immediate and, re and, and directly relevant maybe, and I'll put them up on my, on my website. I love that question. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. And I'll also say to readers a little, an, another little teaser, uh, Sarah has significant discussion of, of primates <laughs> and of early human history uh, in this book and of how we are actually sort of, we're programmed to smack down dominator coalitions <laughs> as you call them. Um, so do look into that part of the book because I think it is hopeful. You know, it's easy to forget that the kind of people who are listening to this call or this you know, Zoom event and, and caring about these issues are exactly in keeping with our species, right? And Absolutely. with what the majority wants. And we have reached a situation where we've allowed a tiny minority to effectively control our society, but it's not what people want. And I think if we better understand ourselves and our history and our opportunities in this moment, uh, we could really begin uh, to turn things around significantly. And I just cannot underscore enough what an incredible resource for that. And, and just what a great read uh, Sarah's book on corruption is. And I think if you read it, you'll probably also get addicted to her work as, as I have and want to go back and, and get earlier books that, that you hadn't seen before, like Thieves of State. But this is a fantastic book. I hope you will, uh, I hope you will buy it. And I hope you'll do that from politics and prose, or at least from your own local independent bookstore. Um, I should also say too, I, I um, as I was looking at the event notice for this, I saw the series of events that politics and prose are going to be having that they've been having. And it's really, really impressive. Uh, just great books and authors, a whole variety of people. I'm actually going back. I want to go back tomorrow and start marking up my calendar. Uh, so make sure that you do that. Um, and uh, Sarah, do you want to maybe say a few words to close us out? And then we'll just thank everyone for coming. Um, it's been wonderful to hear your questions. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to yours, but I tried to at least get the spirit of, of most of them uh, to Sarah. Well, again, can't thank you enough, um, Nancy, for just the, inc the painstaking and um, I want to say invigorating way that you have addressed all of these issues. And, you know, there are, I, I tend to be a little bit somber. I just want to tell you folks, there are a couple of people that I cherish, whom I know that I, ch who, and whom I ch cherish because it's like, make the fight a celebration. Hmm. And Nancy is one of them. And I think if we can do that, if we can, if we can summon the celebratory feeling that you get even in disaster when you're working to help each other, yeah. that, that people suffering the blitz in London got, that people coming together after Hurricane Sandy got, and unfortunately COVID is such that it's driving us apart mm -hmm. to some extent. But if we can somehow summon that kind of energy and what's really important in those moments is all of the identity divides disappear. No one focuses either on what color or gender or political orientation, you know, their neighbor who's in trouble is, or who did what to them, or who, do you know what I mean? It's like these issues that a lot, that, that are being very effectively instrumentalized by kleptocratic networks that often cross all of those identity divides themselves up at the top, but they very effectively manipulate us to divide us up along, be it sect, be it, you know, be it religion, be it ethnic group, be it gender, be it, you name it. We've got to, we've got to drop that and you know link arms because that's the only way you get the egalitarian coalition so marchons as the french say <laughs> thank you so much sarah this has been wonderful there's so much more we could talk about but that's just a, a mark of the richness of the book so thanks to everybody for hanging in uh for so long um uh and we went, went over about seven minutes um but uh i hope you enjoyed it as much as i enjoy talking with sarah and reading your questions um thank you and good night Thank you all.